Welcome to day number 314. We have a celebrity in our midst, Stefan Bauman, who, of course, is the uh, the art teacher on PBS. Stefan, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to my post-studio. This is not quite the studio I usually work in, but this is my winter studio. Okay, well, we'll learn all about that today. What are you going to teach us? I'm actually going to try to do a painting from start to finish. I don't know how far we'll get, but I will be doing a lot of explanation along the way. Okay, now you say you have a winter studio and a summer studio. Tell us quickly about that. Well, the winter studio is actually up in my house. Um, it's And it's also closer to the internet. That's where I do all my coaching. And then my summer studio is actually one of the horse barns that uh, I spend most of my time in. And you live in the, uh, you live north of San Francisco. Where do you live? Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta. Wow. So you probably have snow. We have four feet of snow over the weekend and then it rained for the last two days. So we have four feet of slush. So <laughs> not, not, not a good day to go out and paint outdoors. Yeah. Well, let's get that painting started. Okay. Well, I right. will. Um, this is going to be a painting on Vernal Falls. Uh, I've gone ahead and toned the canvas already. Um, I usually don't tone my canvas. I usually like working on a white surface. But for this case, usually uh, the internet and cameras really don't like having a, uh, a white canvas. And so what I did was I kind of lightly sketched it. Normally, I wouldn't even put in a sketch. I actually sketch it while I do this. But it keeps my concentration up. And I want to start working with my darks. And if I were there on location, uh, for some of you that have seen my PBS show, you would notice that this is kind of the way that I do work. And I'm working on a, on a prime canvas, oil prime canvas. And the canvas itself is um, a masterpiece canvas. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah, it is good stuff. I, I nothing but the best to do a demo for you guys. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> so if I were outdoors painting, I would be doing the exact same thing. Actually laying in my, my, uh, my sketch and laying in my, my foundation. Um, what color are you involves, using? It looks like a, uh, uh, what, a raw sienna or burnt umber? What is it? This is asphaltum. Ah. This is the color that, when we do the conventions, this is the color that everybody gets wild over when I do the demos. And they go out. Um, I buy this one from Richardson. And uh, again, it's called asphaltum. Um, it's actually made out, used to be made out of mummy um, uh, shells back in the old days. And Sargent and some of the really old painters from the 1880s, 1890s would actually use this. Um, one thing I wanted to address real quick is that for me, you know, I have like 12 keys. And if you ever spend any time reading my blogs and, and whatnot, um, I make a point that the horizon line is one thing that's overlooked a lot. And I want to make sure that I wasn't going to have a horizon line in here. It's really important. Most artists don't know it, but the horizon line is exactly where your eyes are. And you kind of have to keep in mind that everything above you is going to be looking up at. And everything below that horizon line, you're going to be looking down at. So if we're actually looking at rocks below the horizon line, the rocks down here would see the tops of. And here we're actually looking up at the bottom of the rocks. And it's the same thing with trees. All these trees that go in here will actually have, will be looking up at them. Um, so it's really important to know that. And the horizon line should be somewhere in the middle. Now, I, I know that everybody says, don't put something in the middle, but something has to be there. Um, the main thing that you want to have in the middle of the painting is the horizon line, because that's the way that we see. We look out at things. No matter where we look at, the horizon line is definitely in in the middle of our eyesight now clearly in this particular case that horizon nine line is not at your eye level so explain that well this is if i were looking at the picture it would be so if i were out there on location looking at it so the middle of the canvas is here and this is lower and this is this is somewhere in the center of the horizon line and if i were standing on a rock looking at vernal falls this is my relationship to vernal falls yeah, okay. So you always want to make sure that that horizon line is in that center area. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so quickly I want to go in. Again, I'm using more asphaltum and um, cobalt blue. That's what kind of makes it, it's going to be a little bit grayer. When I lay in my painting, I usually start off with a combination of 
um, co uh, cobalt blue and asphaltum because I can go back and forth between my my uh, dark gray uh, because the, the asphaltum and the cobalt make it gray and my brown. Now the original asphaltum uh, was a fleeting color like the original alizarin, alizarin crimson. It would ultimately lose a lot of its, it would fade, but the, uh, these are now made with different substances. Yes. Um, a, a lot of, in fact, Michael Hardy uh, uses um, brown oxide as a substitute color. So, so I'm going in, I'm very quickly, I'm just going to sketch this in. Hello, in Netherlands. You guys tell us where you're coming in from, and I'll read them off from time to time to Stefan so that he gets a big ego. <laughs> yeah. well, Hello, I have, Norway. I have coaching students all over the world, so I know they're turning now. Um, all right, good. So I have over 100 coaching students that I coach worldwide. That's um, great. So it's a... Pretty big things. So, as you can see, I'm just very quickly laying in my base. This is where the falls will be. My easel is being uncooperative. And then we have the line up here. This is the, the mountain that's in back. There are a few little trees. And you know, the thing is, when you're working outdoors, you really have to think about Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. At the very end, he says the most crucial thing is memorization. And when you go out to a place like this, Monet said that the light changes every seven minutes. So you've got to literally memorize the lighting effect then. Most landscaping is done on location fail because the artist is not paying attention to where the light is and where the central focal point is. And right now I'm laying in the base colors for the trees. Just a little sketch. There's a few little trees over here. And these are just to jog my memory. I call those little footnotes. They're just to jog my memory to where everything is supposed to be. The crucial thing in a painting, not only do you have like the horizontal line within the middle third, but you want to have the central focal point. And most paintings, most artists forget that the central focal point is key to keeping your viewer. And so I'm going to take white and lay in a base coat for that. We're going to get a little odd lighting here as the sun's coming out. Um, so just bear with it. It might go away in a sec. Okay. And then what I want to do is I want to start laying in my base color for my waterfall. Waterfalls I find to be difficult. So I'm, I'm curious what the trick to them is. The, the trick to waterfall is, is to first thing get that it's a massive amount of water that falls over and the bigger the waterfall, the more uh, power it has, the more it breaks down as it goes over the water. So you get this kind of movement. Um, I like to kind of do this little jogging motion upwards. And I'll show you when I get a little bit of highlight onto the waterfall. But right now, this whole waterfall sits in shadow. Um, the light's coming in. This is from one of my trips I'm kind of trying to recall. And like I said, the most important thing that you can do when you go on a location is to memorize. And I've painted Vernon Falls enough that I thought, you know, this would be a good thing for Eric's crew to... So you're doing this from memory. I've got a couple of black and white things. And there's a in the other room, I have another Vernon Falls like this. So a lot of it is just memory. Yeah. So, All right. Um, but that's the key feature when you go outdoors to paint. Um, like I said, uh, Monet said the light changes every seven minutes. So if you're not thinking about where the light is when you first start, um, you already failed at the beginning. Normally what I tell people is that before you start a painting, what you want to do is you want to sit down and look. And this is what Sargent did also. He just, he wouldn't really care what was in front of him. He wanted a place that was comfortable and he would just sit down and then he'd look up and he would study for about, you know, 10 minutes, no notons, no preliminary sketches, because while you're doing all of that, you're totally left brain thinking about your things. And you, you just have to be with it. And you'd be surprised how the brain memorizes 
things. And so when you have, when you actually sit in front of something and study for a while, your brain actually absorbs it. And uh, you just kind of say, here's my light, here's my shadow. Um, actually say to yourself, what kind of story do I want to tell? Now, Eric, here you were saying about doing waterfalls. You know, it is about getting this energy, you know? So there's not a light. I don't want to put a lot of light on my waterfall here because I want the light to be in the center focal point here. But um, what you do is you take the corner of the brush and you kind of do this little up movement. You actually start at the bottom of these little pillows that come down. If it's a much longer one, you start at the base, kind of do these little pillows and brush upwards. Okay, and while I have that color, I'm going to go ahead and start putting in a little bit of the sky. Normally, if I'm outdoors painting, I don't put in the sky. Uh, that's something you can kind of put in in the studio. Why don't you do it when you're outdoors? Because it takes up time. You know, time is of an essence. You want to spend about two hours on the location painting. And the whole key is to try to get the location painting done in two hours. After two hours, it's not the same painting anymore. So, and since the light's coming from the right-hand side, I'm going to whiten the right-hand side of my sky. And one important thing when you're painting is having transitions. If, and if you notice, I don't know if you can see that here, but I'm starting with the light on the right-hand side and I'm transitioning into a shadow on the left-hand side. Yeah, yep, I see it. Okay, so. <laughs> So you can see that when you're out of location, you can actually get a lot done in a very short period of time. Um, like I said, I don't know how far we're gonna get. I'm not even paying attention to the time. But when I've painted in Yosemite before, uh, you know, it, it's, you, you can only, the, the valley floor is so shallow, it's so steep and it's, it's so narrow that the light changes so quickly that you only have a couple of hours to actually paint something. And now what I'm doing is I'm putting in a shadow. Now, I'm purposely, if you notice, I keep this area light. That's where the light's going to come. And it's always important to make sure that you have an effect as a central focal point, not a thing. Because always remember, if you watch my videos on YouTube, we don't paint things. We paint effects. And so the light... Yeah, you're like the king of drama. Huh? You're like the king of drama. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm definitely a drama queen here, so. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, it's the lighting effects that really make a painting, not the things themselves. You know, when you think about it, if you travel, you could travel midday. If you go to the Grand Canyon and you look at the Grand Canyon midday, eh, it's a big hole in the ground. But if you get there in the morning or in the evening, you have this wonderful lighting effect. That's when it's spectacular. So light is what changes things to take ordinary to extraordinary. So, so I purposely want to make sure that all my water going down, all the waterfalls, is this starting to make sense of what I was trying to do? Yep. The waterfall here and then. So I'm trying to cover my canvas as quick as possible. And you can see like everything's in. I'm putting footnotes in. I'm going to very quickly put in a base for a couple of trees that grow over here. Again, these are footnotes. Uh, some artists, they work really well working from the top left-hand corner all the way through. I've watched them outdoors, and I'm just, like, amazed. Um, I find that the best thing you can do is get in as much information as you possibly can. Now, if you notice, I'm starting to put in some trees here right next to my central focal point. The central focal point has to be the brightest area in the painting. If we cover all this light here, you'd see, boom, that's where the light is. And then right next to the light, you want to have the darkest dark. That's what makes the central focal point actually have the effect of light. Now, I've got a question. You know, there's there's the theory that if you put something dark in the foreground, that makes, you know, the, the other darks recede. And so is that, if, if you needed a dark in your foreground, would you still make that your darkest dark? Um, you, it's the biggest contrast that you're looking for. So let's say in the foreground, we have really dark darks. Um, the, you know, the, the contrast between this water and shadow and the really dark darks that come forward to us isn't going to be the same uh, contrast level as this really light compared to this dark that might not be as dark, but it's the biggest contrast that makes a difference. Okay. Okay. 
and then it's always a transition. You always want to have light as light as this the symphony. It's everything. I call it when I do coaching. I call it the Barbara Streisand effect. And if you don't have good lighting in a painting, you don't have a painting. If you think about all the great masters from Vermeer to Rembrandt, it's always about the effects of light. Um, I find when I'm looking at a lot of artists, they're so busy trying to paint the scene so much. And it really doesn't matter because you could have a really crummy under painting, but if you got awesome light, that's what makes it. Yep. So, so this, this, is, this is what I call the transition. So we go from the, the light coming from behind. And this is why I said, I don't want this waterfall to take all the attention. That's just purely wallpaper for my effect. But my story is to tell the light that comes through the, the, the opening there along the mountain ridge and boom. For those of you who remember back in the past, there's also a tree here that was called the Eleanor Roosevelt tree. I still in honor, she's no longer there, but I still in honor always put her in because it reminds me of the first time I went to, went to Yosemite. All right. I'm going to carry on some of that. What happened? Eleanor cut it down, used it for a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she may have. I, I don't know why they call it the Eleanor Roosevelt tree, but um, she was an amazing lady, so she should have had an amazing tree. And one time it was it was you know standing tall, but in the 30s, I think, it broke in half, and then it was just the, the top half. And within the last 10 years, it's it's fallen over. So, and Well, if, hello, Northern Territory of Australia. Welcome. Australia. Australia, baby. Could be one of my coaching students. I have some of them there. A shout out to all of my coaching students who are watching today. Um, I love you guys. You're great. And I you love know, somebody, somebody. I love you guys. Too. What'd you say? I said I love them too. <laughs> no, somebody who really needs a shout out is Allie. Allie is amazing, who works, you know, for Eric. She is amazing. So shout out to Allie. Amazing. Um, she doesn't watch the show. She's too busy to watch. Well, you could tell her we talked about her. I'll tell her. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, so you can see, I don't know how long we have or how long I've been doing this, but you can start to see it take place. Now, let's you got just about, say uh, you've got at least about 25 or 30 minutes. Yeah, look at look at what I've got here. The whole Burnham Falls. You know, it wasn't you know, location painting is one of those things that um, you kind of have to develop. I mean, I kind of was an okay location painter, and for about ten years, I took students to the national parks to go paint. But I still hadn't mastered the the strength of it. Um, it took about ten years, and it was a trip to uh, Mesa Verde where I had actually gotten uh, the power over uh, uh, planar painting, where everything kind of came together. And, and like you refer to painting as like golf, and it's kind of about getting that hole in one, um, that moment when everything kind of comes together. And you don't know when that happens, and it doesn't happen often, but when everything comes together, when you can actually leave a location that is really complicated, like Mesa Verde, and have something that you put in the back of your car and you go, yes, I got it. It's like getting yeah. a hole in one. Yeah. So, um, so there's Somebody asked what coming. brushes you're using. Excuse me? What brushes are you using? Oh, you know, it, I just pick up any brush. Okay. I, don't, I don't put a lot of emphasis on supplies and brushes. It's like, you know, this, this old thing, um, this is a, yeah, I can't even test. I can flat. Through. Can't read it, can you? <laughs> no, it's got finger mix marks over. It's probably in a Scott or something. But you know, the thing is, I can do a whole painting with just one brush. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter if you have this, you know, fancy. As long as uh, some of my students, they start off, and I said, send me pictures of your brushes, and they have like sticks, these little hard things with no hair on it. And I tell them, I said, a brush that has no hair on it is not a brush; it's a stick. You actually have to have good brushes, um, but it doesn't matter what size, what if it's a filbert or flat. If it pushes paint around, it's a good start. All right. Um, what's really important, though, 
is your canvas base, you know, like the masterpiece canvas. But I've actually gone to um, completely using boards because I find that the tooth of the canvas absorbs light. And one of the things that I love about a painting is getting the effect of light. And all those pores that are in a canvas, and a lot of beginning students, they like go to uh, Michael's and they pick up a, uh, you know, that cheap canvas with all of those, those pores in it. They don't realize that every one of those pores has a light and shadow, a light and shadow, a light and shadow, and it ruins the whole effect. I mean, the old masters really wanted to have a flat surface that light would reflect on. Tight weave, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you don't want to have a lot of texture, and it pays to get a good canvas, and it does pay to have good brushes, um, because that's your sword, that's what you wield. But uh, I don't have like a specific kind of brush or... You look like a guy that would carry a sword. <laughs> You've been peeking. <laughs> I'm like Caravaggio. I carry my sword when I go out. Some people carry guns. I carry my sword. But it's only a show sword. It doesn't cut very well. I use right, it to, right, uh, right. to flay bree and bread. So, okay. So I have a little bit of light here. I'm going to take... Um, uh, Lemon yellow. I'm using uh, cobalt blue, alizarin crimson, and cad yellow light and lemon yellow. And I'm mixing lemon yellow with alizarin crimson. People would love to see your palette at some point. Uh, yeah, I can. Let's see. Uh, I'd have to move the camera. In. Well, why don't we do that? We'll save it for the end. Okay. Yeah, in case I can't get you back again. Um, yeah. So I'm going to put in some highlights into the mountain here. Um, and I just want to kind of put the footnotes in. Now, if I were to do this on location, again, I'm, these would just be all footnotes, like the, the light hitting the edge of the, because the light would be moving. It would be moving. I'd be chasing it and chasing it. So you want to so remember where it lays in, and then you're going to strengthen it later. Yeah, yeah. And that's, the, if you notice, all this is kind of in right now. You know, a lot of times I've been in the natural part, and, and being a planer painter, is, is, I mean, it is so amazing because if you really are a passionate planner painter, you go to areas of the world that, right. is, that is just amazing. I mean, you know, and you, you let things, like I told you about the Mesa Verde painting. Um, when, I, when I went uh, to Mesa Verde, it was so complicated. I mean, I actually have it here, hold on. I don't know if you can actually see it. But it was, there we go. It was so complicated uh, to be outdoors and, and paint is such a complicated thing and try to do it in a couple of hours. That I went there really early and the park was closed and the ranger came and said, what are you doing out here? And I said, oh, I wanted to get early and start painting this place. And now it's closed. And he goes, I'll, let, I'll open it up for you. Nice. So, like, stuff like that happens to you when you're a planer painter. It, and it um, may have been the fact that you were carrying a sword and he wanted to keep his head. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that could very well be. Um, that's how people recognize me, though. But this is the way I like to dress all the time. It stops traffic when they shop at Walmart. Um, you make your own clothes, too, don't you? No, no. I have them made. Custom. Oh, you have them made. You design your own clothes. Yeah, no, I spend too much time coaching the painting. Um, not a lot of time for making clothes and whatnot. Yeah. All right. Um, but um, but surprising, a lot of people have adopted my look, so I've got to come up with something else. Um, again, I'm putting the footnote of more trees up above the waterfall. Um, now, I'm going to uh, start putting in some of the, the, the rocks and formations here. Again, I don't want to have a big contrast here because I want the big contrast to be over there. Now, one of the most important things that uh, artists need to know, and if you want all this stuff, all this stuff's on my blogs, um, on my newsletters. If you go to, uh, actually, I have a free book I'm painting if you go to stephanbauman.com. It's on the screen, for... everybody. It's on the screen. Yeah, is it on the screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's my, that's my, you can go there and get my, a free book from me. Um, and uh, I cover a lot of these, these things about, uh, I have 12 uh, important keys to uh, create great work. 
And um, one of them is the central focal point. One of them is the horizon, what we covered up, covered here. I have, don't have time to go through all of them, but edges. And I find that um, uh, artists, you know, when, when, when I have a student that comes in, they call me from Australia or somewhere and they go, yeah, you know, I want to get more looser with my painting. I want to have, you know, that, that really like Richard Schmidt look. And what I tell them is that actually, if you notice how I'm flirting around all over, putting all these, these really broad dynamic brushstrokes, this is the stuff that they want to get. And what I try to tell them is not something that you do at the end of the painting. It's the passion you have when you first get there. I mean, when you're out there painting for a couple of hours, you get worn out and you get tired. And it's hard at that point to be passionate. But when you're first out there and you're, you know, the sun isn't rising and it's you know, 30 degrees outside, you're really like, ah, let's get going. And so you put in a lot of these big, bold brush strokes that at the end, actually what shows through. So what happens is that you want to have big, bold brush strokes like I'm putting in, bounce around, put in the beginnings of your painting with passion. And, you know, draw these big lines in and get the rocks in and get all this stuff. And then towards the end, when you have this preliminary painting done, you actually start going in and you start looking at the focal point because that's really the important thing. That where the central focal point is, right there, that's where the viewer sees. And we can only see one thing at a time and we look for the thing that has the most light on it. And so your viewer will look under here You'll put your details in this area and you try to get the viewer to focus in on here. And then you slowly start working out from the center focal point into this chaos that you have established at the beginning of the painting. Um, lo and behold, this chaos is that brush strokes that you love when you look at those really loose, awesome paintings. That's, you know, as you can see here, I've got a lot of craziness in here. And when we start getting the light into this area and I start doing the detail and the little twigs and sticks and, you know, we can, we can. Yeah. And if you do detail in. everywhere, you're going to draw the eye and it's not going to know where to land. Well, you know, the thing is our, our depth of field is very small. So like if I look at a person's face or if you look at a person's face, you can only see one eye or the other. Right. I mean, that's how small our depth of field is. A lot of times when people do portraiture, they get it wrong because of the nose and the mouth. We don't see the nose and the mouth. It's usually out of focus. This is out of focus. When somebody's got a lazy eye, you're going, well, wow, what eye do I look at? I mean, that's how small our focal point is. And then the landscape, same thing. You can only see this. And what you do is you tell the viewer, okay, glance over here, but come back to the here, come back to here, come back to here. This, and if you notice all of the great master paintings, they're great right where you want them. It's like theater. You know, if that's yeah. why I call it like the Barbara Streisand. They have, you have a stage with a thousand people on it and you bring a, a, a beam of light to Barbara's face. What are you going to see? You right. see right. So um, anyway, these are all stories my students are listening to laughing because they've all heard them. Um, so um, now remember I said about the horizon line. Um, with the horizon line here, I'm looking down at these rocks. And I've painted here before in my PBS television show on painting in the national parks. We did an episode here. And I know that when we're standing on these rocks up here, we're looking down on these rocks here. We're gonna be looking, since the horizon line is in this area here, we're gonna be looking at these rocks here. So I'm going to be drawing the rocks without any tops uh, or bottoms. It's just the sides of the rocks that I'm going to be painting in here. And uh, anything that gets put in up here, we'll actually be looking at the underneath part of the rocks. So the trees that we're looking at up here, we're looking up underneath them. So when we're painting the trees, we have to actually imagine what they look like as we look up at them. And people, the artists get this wrong. You know, they don't, they don't think about the, where they are, the relationship to the scene. So all these trees up in here that go up here, we're going to be actually looking up at these branches and stuff, looking up underneath. And the, and the angles of the tree is completely different than, than uh, if we're just painting at it. 
these trees that are close to the horizon line are actually going to be, we're going to be at them. But as long as we get higher, we're going to see a little bit underneath them also. Anything that I do down here, we're going to be looking down on. Right. So a great trick to remember that uh, is what, here, Stefan. Yes. A great trick is you do this. You put you put your brush, not the not the brush end, on on your face, and that will help you establish where your horizon line is. And then if you look down, it tells you which direction the strokes should go to create the perspective. Perfect. You should you should be doing this instead of me. Well, I learned that from Joanna Arnett at Full Color yeah. Week. Um, one thing that I've learned is that you kind of hold a thing to your eyes and you just kind of move it up and down until your eyes don't see the top or the bottom of a uh, canvas. And that's kind yeah, of that where the horizon line is. Yeah. Great. So, but it makes a huge difference when you're doing something that is like a vista like this. I mean, you know, I don't know if you've ever walked in uh, uh up to vernal falls but literally when you walk up to this the people are like this big they're they're about that size and if you yeah. can imagine you look up at eleanor roosevelt tree you can imagine what this waterfall is and so again, do you like, ever put in a, do you ever put in a, a person just so you can show the scale i do you know i i like actually putting in more, more animals than anything else so i'll put in i'll put in something for the scale um I haven't yet ever put one in for Vernal Falls, but it really is amazing. As you come around here, had you ever hiked up here, Eric? I don't even know where Vernal Falls is. <laughs> it's in Yosemite. Um, Vernal, Falls, Vernal Falls is one of the most amazing places in America. Um, it, it's a two-mile hike from the, from the valley floor. And when you walk up here, they call it the rainbow. And this is where you need to go, especially if you go in May or June. Uh, right when you pass uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt tree, you kind of come around, and there uh, they call that the Rainbow Trail. And nice. everywhere you look, there are rainbows. Every direction, nice. there's just rainbows coming because the way that the light goes into this canyon. And the wind is like at 60 miles an hour. So everybody there has to have uh, raincoats and stuff because you just get drenched with all of the right. water that's coming off of it. Yeah, you want to go there in the summertime. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it. Well, it's like baptism. It's like you know, it's a nature baptism or something. It's really right. Great. Well, I've painted um, Yosemite, but I've not painted that falls. Well, why don't you come out here and we'll go there together? All right, you're on. And then when you hike, when you hike up here, you actually walk along the the wall here, and the people are so small you don't see them. It's it's like uh, Yellowstone Falls, which is huge. And as you get up here, there's another fall in the back that's Nevada Falls, equally spectacular. So. Now, people are asking, somebody asked, these are oils, I assume. Is that correct? Yes, I'm an oil snob. And students who start off with me coaching, they'll, they'll start off with watercolors and they'll start off with, with uh, acrylics. Um, but I get them going over to oils pretty quickly. I mean, with Gamsol nowadays and, uh, you know, the different types of mediums that we're using, uh, they're no longer dangerous. And notice I don't have, look, Mom, no hands. There's no gloves. Um I, I, the, the fear that's put out there is, oh, you're going to die. Well, you know, think about, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. They were painting with raw pigments, grinding them down. down. Uh, they were working with raw turpentines, and they lived to be 80, 90 years old, older yeah, than anyone else. Yeah, but think how old they could have lived. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know, when you reach that certain age, you know, I think everybody around them goes, God, I wish Michelangelo would die. But nonetheless, the thing is, if it was that deadly, you'd have people dropping over all the time. You know, artists would all be, live to be 30 or 40. They all live to be older than anyone else. So if anything, and, and if you could, not Monet, but Manet died of syphilis. So actually sex is worse for you than oil painting. So get that. <laughs> yeah, let's open that dialogue. That, that'll be popular. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, that's just in case people are bored and they're not listening anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, anytime you, you mention that word, everybody perks up. <clears throat> so here again, and see, you can get the effective trees. Again, I haven't switched any brushes here, you know, but look at the effective trees that you can with the really soft. Again, soft edges everywhere. You've got about 15 minutes. Wow, see? And you're doing great. They said it couldn't be done. Oh, no, they didn't. We knew, <laughs> we knew better. 
<laughs> well, let's see here. I'm going to get. Um, I'm going to. said we should go to Igasu Falls in uh, Argentina. There's 200 waterfalls in a five mile area. We'd have to take a lot of canvas. We would, and we'd have to paint them. You know, one of the secrets, and I'll tell this right now, but if you really want to learn how to do plein air painting, is to actually go on a trip and don't bring the camera. That's really, if you want to learn how to go like the old masters and go through the park step by step, slowly painting and really rely because a lot of planar painters, I've seen planar painters stick their camera outside of their car and drive through the park taking pictures. Um, I, I see a lot of planar painters going, oh, I'll finish it off in the studio using my photos. And then they wonder why their paintings don't have that wonderful passion to them. Yeah. If you leave a place and you don't have a picture for it, then you start learning what is really important to get. And again, it's usually the first 15 minutes when you get to a place, and that is the lighting effect. Now, remember, no artist has any business out there painting after 9 o'clock. And no, business, no artist should be painting between 9 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Though at that period of time, the lighting is, is you know, dull. But when you get up at six in the morning, I know that's really hard for a lot of people, but you know, once, in a, once a week priests do it. So you could do it once a week also. And if you, get up, if you get up early in the morning and you stand in a place like this and the light turns on, that moment is what you want to capture. Don't paint during that moment, look at it. Yeah. Look at that moment, cherish that moment, memorize that moment like Carlson said in his book, memorization, memorize what that is. Say to yourself, where's my central focal point? Where do I want to have the, view, the viewer land? What is, what is the, what's the light doing? Take notes about what's going on and then retain that. Usually what I would do is, obviously you could see I did this in about 45 minutes. What I would do right now is I would take this easel and turn away from the scene. And I would work the next hour completely with me in the canvas, looking over at my shoulder to see, oh, where's that rock at or what kind of tree that was? Because yeah. I don't want to be influenced by all the different lighting effects. And if something more spectacular happens, I go, thank you. But I'll just save that for another painting. Yeah. So it's, it's really important to, to stay focused on your original idea. You've got about um, 15 minutes. Yeah, see. Okay, Eric. So you said something about water, you know. Here, here's one of the key things about water is a lot of it's the edge. You don't see a lot happening in water. It's, it's usually just kind of chaotic. So what I'm doing here is I'm bringing those, remember I told you those upstrokes? It's these outer strokes that help get the, the feeling of water. Of course, the soft edges where the water hits and see when I put a lot of that paint in, I can start doing finger painting. Now, those of you that insist on wearing rubber gloves, you'll never know the joy of the, the, the edge of a pinky and rubbing paint around. But I want to kind of get that, that water, that misty quality. And one of the things that people do when they lay the water down like that is that they forget sometimes, you know, they keep going lighter and lighter. But sometimes it's best to go darker and actually get more shadows on the inside of it. And that helps you at this point, too, you kind of do a reverse thing to help break up because it's just textures, lots of different textures, all kind of in a shadow area because you want to create depth because there's a lot of water coming over that, that edge. I want to darken the rocks around the water. That helps bring more emphasis on my waterfall. But it also gives the feeling that the water is uh, stained the rocks or wet the rocks. On. Somebody asked what you keep dipping your brush into. Uh, I keep dipping my brush into turpentine to clean it. Okay. So it's just dirt and it's a rag. <clears throat> Nothing up my sleeves. Um, <laughs> okay. And the white I'm using for no reason, I just grabbed it, is. Uh, Primates and zinc. And I thought, oh, people are going to crazy. You're using zinc. Don't worry about it. 
It's not going to, nothing's going to happen in your lifetime. And if your work's really that great, somebody will figure out how to conserve it. So um, I'm not really one of these big fans of like worrying about the future. Uh, I grab whatever I can now. Okay. And now I'm going to, uh, I need to squeeze out some more white. Are there any questions coming through, Eric? Um, probably. I'll check. Uh, you you never use white dr directly out of the tube, though. You always add something into it. Yeah. No, I never use pure pure anything. It's always a variation. And I keep my palette really simple. Like you said, I have um, cobalt blue, lizard crimson, cad yellow, uh, medium cad yellow. I, I have a larger palette of highlight colors. Sometimes I use sailor yellow, green, and, and cerulean blue. Um, and my shadow colors are really kind of simple. It's usually the asphalt tone. And I can, you know, make a yellow ochre out of that. Um, I don't, I've been painting for so many years that there's no mystery in color mixing for me. Um, I think color is, is uh, the least important um, in, all of the, in all of the whole faction. I mean, uh, you'll hear artists say value is the most important, but to me, temperature is the most important, which is a whole another discussion, but... Um, Anyway, so you can see I'm just kind of putting in, see the texture I'm putting in? You know, most people will take their waterfall and they go like, you know, but water doesn't fall like that. It falls in bunches as it comes over these large falls. I'm going to take cobalt blue. So we're putting in, and again, I want to emphasize the edge of the waterfall. So I'm putting the dark along the edge. I put in, if you ever go to Vernal Falls, there's this wonderful transparent blue-green, same thing Yellowstone Falls. And so I want to put that blue-green in as a base. Um, it only happens when the light actually hits it. Um, but you can see, yeah, and I'm not really paying attention too much because I wanted to show you how to do uh, the, the little um, bags of water. Um, but you can see it's, it's, I'm losing my central focal point again. And so, you know, I wanted to get that toned down again. Sorry, Eric. Let that music get toned down. It's really important to keep that central focal point. The central focal point should be no larger than an egg. That's so at some point, point, would you pump the light up on that more, or is it where you want it to be? What, on the waterfall? Uh, on, the on, focal, on the focal point. Oh, on the focal point? That's uh, almost pure lemon yellow and white. Yeah, it's a little hard to tell. Maybe at the end we can take the camera and get a little closer. Yeah, so. So, and then, you know, here again, too, I'm going to darken the water around it. You know, people say, well, you know, I, I can't get anything lighter because I've gone, you know, it's like I, I'm using pure lemon yellow and white that doesn't get any lighter. What am I going to do? I'm going to die. And when you hit that spot, you have to make everything else darker. You know, so by darkening the water down here, um, you can see that that pumps the highlight back up here. And like now, I said, would you try to use a little bit of a complementary color, you know, to that yellow? Are, no, so I don't like using complementary colors. They irritate me. Oh, um, they do? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, the complementary colors. Again, I'm not a big, big color fan. I'm a temperature fan. But co uh, complementary colors, they cause a lot of vibration. And um, they do catch your eye, but not as much as just the, the effect of light on something. Um, too much complementary color, like when you see an orange on a blue background, people go, oh, that's just one. But it's really irritating when you see the two colors battling it out. It does make them bounce, but it doesn't feel like you want to look at that painting for a long time. Um, so complementary colors are a bit overrated in my book. Okay. Um, Again, that's me, though. And, you know, I know a lot of people who turn into these, these videos, they're always thinking, oh, I'm going to watch Stefan today because I'm going to find out some magical, wonderful thing. Just that one thing, that one thing that's going to change the way I paint forever. But, you know, in essence, the best thing you can do is just paint because everybody has their own little shtick. Um, well, I think yeah. you did say one thing that will change their life forever, and that is don't paint, don't paint things, paint light. Paint light, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you notice, I transitioned from a, from a light to a shadow. You'll notice how my shadows are really intense here. 
I would even go so far, again, I'm going to clean my brush here, same brush, um, and I'm going to even darken behind here. Um, you know, later on, when I get into the studio or if I'm out there for a while, and I'm just bouncing all over here, just, and this is the way I paint, though. You know, I, I go out there and I put footnote, 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 and then refine, refine, refine. But as I darken around here, that light just becomes more and more. You can see that. I sure, don't know yeah. if you can see it on the screen. Yeah. But it's it's a darkening of all this that makes the light bounce. So you can go back in and brighten something by darkening everything else around it. It's amazing that you've pulled that off in, in the short amount of time you have. Yeah. Well, you, you know, Eric, I've been painting for 40 years. So it's like, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's like. Uh, and you're only you, you gotta, so That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, if you, a lot of people, they watch my YouTube video, but. You know, to me, the most important thing when you're when you're painting is the knowledge. And a lot of people say, well, you don't paint. You, all you do is talk. The really, if you listen to my YouTube videos and listen in, you get a lot of these insights that you know, stick in your head and you get a lot of answers. Now, there are a lot of people that will paint and not talk. And I feel that it's more important to get knowledge than it is just watching somebody paint. It's a very passive activity. Well, you don't know if you're painting and you're not talking. We don't know what you're thinking. Yeah, Wait, yeah. Oh, but you've seen, why, you've seen, the why behind it. Yeah, Gurney said, I have an uncanny ability to paint and talk at the same time. So, you know, but, but doing the television show, it's caused me to kind of get that way, though. Yeah, you're, you're a pretty well-known guy. <laughs> I am. I've got the gray hairs to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't you come back on Quickly, show us your palette. Uh, let us see your sculpture, and then we're going to pick a winner. Let's see. How can I do this here? Uh, I don't know. Sure that we're going to get a jiggle and a jog. That's all right. Whoops. There's the jiggle. And here's my palette. Oh, you have one of those uh, uh, one of those palettes. That, that's fabulous. That's beautiful. Oh, I love I love those those palettes that you know kind of. I don't know if they even make those anymore. I know uh, I uh, they're very hard to find now. I know they're very expensive, yeah. but and they have drawers great. on the side that you put your yeah. in, you know. So and then over here is my my kids, my sculptures. Um, there's a bear. Um, there's uh, so, very nice. Yeah. So so yeah, this is another passion. This is a, a seal rock. Um, here's a bear standing up. He's got a couple of cubs. Now, are those bronze or are they clay? What are they? They're actually wax. They're wax. Yeah, so I do waxes. Um, and uh, I just find that the wax is more, uh, they stay together better. If you do in the clay and you don't cast them right away, um, they have a tendency to kind of break apart and get hard. The waxes, is, in summertime, they sometimes kind of start to limp. <laughs> then I have metal things. But... Uh, sometimes it gives them a little more character, more drama. Well, Stefan, this has been a pleasure having you on today. And uh, uh, you're such a great teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, it's, it's a passion. I mean, that's why I've got so many coaching students around the world. So, yeah. Well, everybody go to stefanbauman.com to find out about his teaching, his videos, his PBS show, which is called The Grand View. And probably a hundred other things we don't know about. He's pretty, yeah. pretty industrious. Do you, do you get, do people walk up to you and ask for your autograph? They do. They recognize me from PBS though. Is that um, a little they, weird? Um, you know, they, they, what's weird is when I'm at Taco Bell and they ask me you know, because <laughs> I, and I, and I forget because we filmed that so long ago, but I'm still on the air. Um, but yeah, people actually start staring. I go, why are they staring at me? I usually think it's my clothes. And they'll like come up and they go, aren't you an artist on television? And I go, yep. And they go, ah, my father watches you all the time. You're like in our house 24 seven. So yeah, I do have some people that really watch me a lot. That's fun. That's great. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for being on today. And if you, if you guys will just hang in there for a couple of minutes, I've got a couple of quick announcements and then, and then uh, we're going to go. Stefan, thank you again. Thanks, Eric. Have a good day. Visit him at stephanbauman.com, S-T-E-F-A-N-B-A-U-M-A-N-N, two N's, dot com. Uh, 
I didn't introduce myself at the beginning of the show. My name is Eric Rhodes. I publish Plein Air Magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, and a bunch of newsletters. We do virtual conferences, live in-person conferences, um, videos, instructional videos. We do a lot of different things. You can find everything we do at streamlinepublishing.com slash everything. Uh, streamlinepublishing.com slash everything. And, you know, it's just tons of tons of things that we do. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention to you today at 3 p.m., I'm here every day at 12 noon, uh, five days a week. Uh, since coronavirus started, it was seven days a week for months. Now we're at day 314. Every day at three, we also do an art instruction video. Uh, last but not least is I am taking a group of people to Russia uh, it's a Russian art trip. It's, uh, just go to paintrussia.com. We're going to do it in September, assuming it's safe. And uh, we have uh, 48 people going. And we have, I think, either four or three seats left. And so I'd like to get that sold out. If you've been on the fence about it, now's the time to make your decision. But uh, it's going to be phenomenal. We are going to have a private, private Imagine going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and them saying, uh, by the way, you're the only people here. Roam around and go wherever you want to go. That It's going to be like that at the Great Hermitage Museum. We have that. We're, we're going to the Russian Museum. We're going to the Tretikov Museum. Uh, we're going uh, to paint. We're going to Ilya Repin's uh, art studio. We're going to be painting in the countryside in old Russia. And we're going to be painting where uh, the great Russian artists all painted, including the academic Adasha, which is pretty cool, and some of the small villages. And then we're going to be painting and touring in Moscow. It's going to be a two-week trip, and it is phenomenal. So go to paintrussia.com to learn about it and grab your seat because there's only three or four left. All right? Thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. I hope you'll join me every day. We're here 314 days. And the reason we did this is because we wanted to be there for you. You know, coronavirus was pretty frightening, still is. And a lot of us have been in lockdown. Uh, most of us were in lockdown at some point. Uh, we're free here in Texas, but we're careful. And uh, we want to just make sure that we're lifting up your spirits and making you feel good and giving you something to think about and focus on. And so thank you for tuning in. And we will see you tomorrow at 12 noon. So that's tomorrow.